So, James chapter 1. When we went through the series on the Psalms, I preached on two of the verses, one single verse and about 30 minutes on each verse. And there are 27 verses in this first chapter of James. So I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, can't do justice to it really. On reflection, it might have been good just to kind of do it in sections, but that would have been a long series. So what we're having today, as I kick off this series, is an overview of the first chapter of James, a letter which was written as an encouragement to believers uh, that they might live out their faith in Christ. And so um, we're going to begin where better than, um, than chapter 1 and verse 1, where James writes an introduction. Um, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, we believe, was the brother of Jesus. And it's interesting that he doesn't kind of pull rank or status and say, you know, this is a letter from James, none other than the brother of Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't. He says, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing that strikes me about this letter is that James knows exactly who he is in relation to his older brother, Jesus. He knows who he is and he knows his place. He is none other than a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He humbles himself. And he talks about humility later on in the chapter. So having introduced himself, he goes on in verses 2 and 3 to say, Consider it pure joy... My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. James is writing to um, believers in the church, to his brothers and sisters. He's writing to you and to me today, and he is telling um, the church what to expect and how to respond. We are to expect trials of many kinds. We are to expect our faith to be tested. James doesn't write if, if you face trials, <coughs> but whenever you face trials. James is a realist. He tells it how it is. So how should we as Christians respond when we face these trials of many kinds? When our faith is tested? Do we cry out, woe am I? Why me? Why me, Lord? No. Do we say, Lord, save me from this time of trial? We pray in the Lord's Prayer. But do not test me. James says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. As a realist myself, when I read this, I think, well, what kind of a warped idea is this? That we face trials and tribulations and temptations and we respond joyfully well the thing is this it's God's idea and God often operates in a different way than we and, and his, his mind certainly works differently to ours and I like God's ideas because, well, they seem somehow to work when you put them into practice. James says, you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
I've shared testimony before and my early years were traumatic, I suffered bereavements of very close family members one by one by one and when I reflect on my life I always say I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't prevent any one of those deaths from taking place. I wouldn't change anything because I am who I am today because of what has gone before. In fact, if I could go and change anything and interfere, I probably wouldn't be here today. I'd probably be in home house prison or somewhere like that, going on where I was born and the background in which my life began. We know the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And James says, let's let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. In other words, go through it. Yeah. Persevere. Keep on. Hang on in there. So that perseverance can finish that work. And when I read this, I ask the question, am I mature and complete as a Christian? We should all ask ourselves that question uh, as we read this. Are we maturing? Are we moving towards completion? Uh, this isn't the finished product. We look at the way that we live our lives, we look at the people that we are, we look at the, the way we respond to life circumstances, and when it gets tough, and when it's hard, do we cry out, why me? Why me, Lord? Why should this happen to me? Why, or why, or why? Do we cry out, why? Mature Christians don't. When we mature in our faith, we don't cry out to God, why me? We endure joyfully. We endure joyfully. We face trials joyfully. Because like Nehemiah from the Old Testament, we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy being a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We've been there, we've looked at the fruit of the Holy Spirit and we, we know that that, that is, is a seed that is within each of us to come to maturity. And when we have that joy, we have that inner strength. The joy of the Lord gives us strength. The joy of the Lord enables us to, to come through trial and tribulation. And we are given wisdom because those who lack it are to ask for it, says James. And so what James seems to be saying here about trials and tribulations is that they can be a means through which God helps his people to grow to maturity, to grow in faith, to deepen their faith. And we all of us, all of us undergo, in some way, shape or form, trials and tribulations. James assures his readers that God can and does and will work through these times. So verses 5 to 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Sometimes it's because of a lack of wisdom we don't understand that we, we cry out to God, why, why? We ask God and he gives generously without finding fault. He gives it to us. But when we ask, we must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave on the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such people are double-minded and unstable in all that they do. James is saying, if we are believers, then we should believe. That's what believers do. We should believe. When we ask God for something, we should believe that he's going to give us it. 
that's when we are asking something in accordance with his will and purpose. But if we are mature in our faith, going back a verse or two, if we are mature in our faith, we won't ask for God, from God, anything that isn't in accordance with his will and purpose. If we ask, we must believe and expect and God will give it. Sometimes I do struggle, I do struggle in my faith, I struggle to make sense of life. We don't always know why stuff happens. We don't. Um, everything in the garden isn't always rosy. If only we had the wisdom to understand these things. God says, ask for it. Ask for it. God will give us, believe it, God will give us insight into these things. Whenever and wherever we struggle to understand, even with faith, sometimes life can be a struggle. Ask God. And James says, to doubt God's ability and willingness to answer is to be like that wave on the sea that's tossed about and blown, is to be double-minded. Double-minded. That's the Christian that neither believes now the summit. Yeah, yeah, well, God will answer prayers, but maybe not my prayer. Yeah, God can do this, but maybe not for me. God is all-powerful, but he has limitations. As Christians, when we mature in our faith, we become single-minded. Not arrogant. We don't have blinkers on. We come to a mature faith that knows, that has a knowledge that God is and God can and God will and God does. We're single-minded. We are focused on God, almighty God, who will not let us down. I wish I was more like that. I really do. To be single-minded, to be focused, to be expectant. Sometimes I am that wave being tossed about. But when I'm washed up on the shore, God is there to pick me up and not to be judgmental. Verses 9 to 11, we read believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass like a wildflower. The sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. What's happening here is the, the values of the world are being turned upside down. In actual fact, the values of the world are already upside down. You look at the world in which we live. The world to which we have different values. What, what, what in actual fact is that the world seems as though it's been turned upside down. It's been turned the right way up. This is what the scripture does. It turns things the right way up. In a world where the humble are often downtrodden, James says to the humble, take pride in your high position. The humble are to be thought of highly, while the rich should be aware of their riches, which will wither away. There's no condemnation upon those who are rich, just that kind of sense that the rich should be aware that what they have can just wither away to nothing. Both the lowly and the mighty, the poor and the rich should trust God implicitly, should hang on in there rather than be concerned with what they have or haven't got. Whatever our circumstances, we should be hanging on in there. We should keep on keeping on, keep going. Because in verse 12 we're told, blessed is the one who perseveres. 
under trial because having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the one who hangs on, who keeps on keeping on. Blessed is the one who keeps going. Blessed is the one who doesn't give up. Blessed is the one who perseveres. So moving to verses 13 to 15. An interesting verse. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. It seems to me that what James is saying here is don't blame God. Don't point the finger at God. Don't pass the book. When you're tempted, don't blame God. God doesn't tempt us. Again, back to the Lord's Prayer, we pray, lead us not into temptation. It's as if some people have the understanding that if we don't pray that, God will lead us into temptation. He'll put it there in front of us. No, rather deliver us from evil. Lead us away. Lead us away from temptation. I need to pray that prayer more because I'm not led away from temptation often enough. When I open my eyes on a morning and, and my senses come into being, right from the word go, I'm tempted. I was tempted to turn over in bed this morning and leave you lot to it. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked in industry, I often had the Monday morning feeling. And then when I answered the call to ministry, I thought, great, I'll never get that Monday morning feeling again. I get it on a Sunday sometimes, I tell you. <laughs> honestly, honestly. <coughs> sometimes when I was in interest, industry, I used to pull a, uh, pull a sickie. I've never done it in ministry. But I remember, I remember. Temptations do come our way. And the human mind does work against us sometimes with bad thoughts. When we're attracted by things that aren't good for us. These are the things that God wants to save us from. Don't be, don't be deceived, James says in verses 16 to 18. Don't be deceived, dear sisters and brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits for all he created. Our God is a generous God. He's a good God. Our heavenly Father on this Father's Day, let's remember the goodness and the generosity of our Heavenly Father, who wants the best for us, who gives the best to us, who offers, offers it graciously, even though we don't deserve it. Our God who created the heavens is the source of light, and his love is steadfast, and it's certain, and he doesn't change, says James. He doesn't waver. He's steadfast, he's sure, single-minded, not double-minded of one mind. His truth is the word of truth and it gives light and it gives life to all who receive it. The word of God to feed us and enrich us. So to verse 19, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Take note. Are you making notes? Writing it down. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Right, let's see if you're as bright as the, the 930 congregation. How many years do you have? 
See, you're working it out. Someone's got a calculator. Yeah. How many years? Two. 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 Okay. Sometimes I say, hey, look, I've got one here. Call me Van Gogh. But for the purpose of being here this morning, I think all of us have two ears. How many mouths do we have? One. One. This to me seems to be another of God's ideas in his creation and his design of human beings. He, he gave us two ears and one mouth. And somehow I wonder, does that mean that God wants us to listen more and talk less? Be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. It doesn't say don't, don't say anything. Don't become angry. Yeah, by all means. But think about it. Be quick to listen. Be still. Listen. Wait. I have to confess that sometimes I've given the answer before the question has been Finish. I, I bet you do that on the chase, don't you, and other quiz shows. Should have listened to the whole question. You've just lost a thousand pounds. Listen, be quick to listen, wait, be patient. Let whoever's speaking get to the end of what they're saying. Think about it. The human response is to respond even before the person asking the question has finished asking. To jump in with both feet. To say what's on your heart and mind, well, no, no. Just to say, to speak, to get your two penneth in. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. I, I think our first response, our initial response, is always the human response. Unless You've got where James wants us to be, to be mature and perfect. If you're there, great. Then your first response will be the right response, the righteous response. <coughs> Even today, my first response, I have to think about it. Is that the right response? Is it the righteous response? Even this very week, I was responding to an email and my study is off the kitchen and Emma was in the kitchen and she said, are you wound up, Graham? Are you angry? <laughs> so I pressed the delete button, the backspace, <laughs> looking at what I was saying and it was true what I was saying. But you know, it wasn't bodybuilding. It wasn't wholesome and it wasn't going to be helpful. <laughs> To the person I was writing to. Usually, when I get emails like that, I shut my computer down at the end of the day and when I switch on, and the next morning, and having had some prayer time, I respond graciously. I listen to the person that's. But, but you know, Paul was the same. He was accused of being very bold in what he wrote, but a bit of a coward when he stood before the people. Think about what you say and how you're going to say it. And a lovely text from my daughter this morning, appreciating her father. It seems that all the scars I inflicted upon her, emotional and otherwise as a child, have healed. I tried to be a good dad, but I wasn't the best dad. I've told her that, you know. I was the best dad I could be at the time. And if only we could go back and start all over again, I think I might be a better dad than I was. 
said to my kids, you can tell us anything, you know. Whatever, whatever goes wrong in life, whatever you do, if you think, well, if you think we're not going to like it, we'll, we'll always love you. I'll always be your dad. And then she would tell me, and I would shout. <laughs> no, no, I didn't shout. I would be accused of shouting, that's it. <laughs> You're shouting, Dad. I gave a demonstration this morning at 9.30. I went over there. And then I shouted. Because I would say to her, in a shouting voice, I am not shouting. <laughs> Just to show what shouting sounded like. Just to demonstrate that I was loudly, calmly collected. <laughs> but I wasn't shouting. Yeah, I lost it. Well, then when I calmed down, and when she rang at 3.30 in the morning, Dad, come and pick me up. I've lost my taxi fare. I don't know where I am. I don't know what day it is. <laughs> And I drove her home. <laughs> she said on the drive, you're not very pleased with me, are you, Dad? <laughs> Never said anything all the way home. See? I was slow to speak. <laughs> and the only words I said to her were, good night. <laughs> it's not easy sometimes to put it into practice. And sometimes it's those who are closest to us that get the sharpest response. One of my favourite sayings is, don't put your mouth into motion before your brain is in gear. Are you listening? Are you listening? James says, verses 22 onwards, don't merely listen to the world. Don't, don't merely listen to the word to deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror and then after looking at their face in the mirror immediately goes away and forgets what they look like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Are you listening? Are you listening to the word of God? Are you doing what the word says? Are you putting your faith into practice? Because this, I think, is the key teaching of, of, of the letter of James. He urges his hearers to be doers of the word. It's not good enough just to listen to the word of God, to read it. The Bible reveals God's ways to us that we might walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that we might put our faith into practice. What will you be doing when you leave church today? Well, hopefully, having listened to the word of God, you will be doing the word of God when you leave the church today. You will be putting what you have heard into practice. Otherwise, what's the point? If we come to church and to worship and we listen to the word and we're no different than when we were when we arrived, what's the point? If we have listened to the word and it hasn't changed us in any way, what's the point? I really believe the word of God must have a challenging effect upon us to change the way we live. When I sit where you are, I expect to be challenged. God does, yeah, he does say, I love you, Graham. I love you to bits. I'm your heavenly father, that's my job. And I will always love you. And do you know, Graham, you've done some good things this week. Can't remember what they are right now, but you've done some good things this week. But... And that's the bit I need to be reminded of, the but. And, and that's the, the, um, 
the uh, format of the letters that, that God writes through Jesus to the, work, the churches of Asia Minor commends them for good things, the good things they've done, but there's a but. I have this against you. So when I'm sat where you are, I wait for God, for the Holy Spirit to prompt me, to show me where, well, I need to change because I'm not quite measuring up to the word. I'm falling short of God's standards. And I need the Holy Spirit to show me just exactly where. So that I might be a better dad. Or a better husband or a better minister. For 21 years I was a chaplain in a young offenders institution. Part time I would do a session or two a week. And I remember telling the lads that I loved God more than I loved my wife. I loved God more than I loved my children. Because in doing so, I was a better father to my wife and a better husband to my children. He somehow missed the point because he'd obviously been thinking about this because when I was back in on duty later in the week, our paths crossed and he said, hey, yo, you're out of order, you. I said, why? What's, what's going on here? He said, you shouldn't love God more than you love your wife and children. And I was able to sit down with him. And he became a member of our Bible study group. and uh, He grew in his faith and matured as a Christian. Yeah, we need to measure up to God's word. And uh, finally, finally, as we consider verses 26 and 27, we, we read, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. <coughs> religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. There's a difference between religion and Christianity. Sometimes when people meet me and they, they discover I'm a minister, I do, don't publicise it really. Sometimes with a dog collar on, you, you kind of, well, you give them a start of a ten. But I don't always wear my dog collar. And sometimes I get alongside people, and get into a conversation and it comes round to what do you do? And I say, I work for an international charity. Oh, right, okay. What sort of a charity? I said, oh, well, we have homes for the elderly. We, we're, we're leading uh, on, on work with children. And, and uh, we're involved in safeguarding. And a lot of youth work, a lot of work with children and with people. And, and then eventually it might come out that I'm a minister in the church. And the number of people that say, well, I'm not religious. Uh, and then I say, oh, thank God for that, because I'm not religious either. And that's a, that's a discussion opener. <coughs> but there are a lot of religious people in church. A lot of religious people in church. Um, a lot of religious people out there as well who do things because it's the religious thing to do, and if you don't do it this way, it's not the right... It almost becomes like a superstition. And, and we can create our own superstitions in the practice of our own faith. If we don't do it, then, oh, heaven's going to fall. If we don't say grace before our meal. To the point at which sometimes saying grace becomes a religious thing to do, not something that we're truly thankful for. Sometimes it's worth eating what you've got and then saying thank you. Just to be truly honest, if I served it up, you wouldn't be that thankful. <laughs> It was the religious people Jesus had more trouble from than anyone else. It was the religious people that did away with Jesus. 
you can be very very religious and a very poor Christian you may consider yourself religious but a true Christian will keep a tight rein on their tongues will think twice before they speak and how they respond you may come to church religiously every week but a true Christian will hear the word and will put it into practice a true Christian will love their neighbour as they love themselves the religious person attends church hears the Bible, says their prayers, while the true Christian attends worship, listens to the word, and becomes the answer to the prayers. I've run out of verses. So to conclude, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Some highlights of James chapter 1. Expect many trials. Expect your faith to be tested respond with joy ask yourself the question are you a mature and a complete Christian are you a maturing Christian heading towards completion or are you an immature and incomplete Christian are you lacking in wisdom ask God for it expect God to give it to you when it comes to the things of God be focused be single minded be expectant don't blame God when temptations come your way. Remember, God is the source of all generosity. Are you listening? Are you putting the word into practice? Are you religious or are you a true Christian? If we leave church today no different to the way we were when we arrived, what's the point?